my name is Jeff Bellison. As the slide says, I'm the Assistant University Librarian for Scholarly Communication, Assessment, and Personnel at Brigham Young University, and I'm joined by my colleague, Elizabeth Smart, who is our Scholarly Communications Librarian. Our, this is just a brief outline of our presentation. I'm going to do a little in setting the overall context, talk about current efforts in the Harold Bailey Library at BYU. Elizabeth will touch on the results of a recent survey she and a colleague conducted, and then we'll both uh, talk a little about opportunities for the future, and certainly hope to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, last week, some of you may have participated in the EDUCAUSE 2011 conference that took place in Philadelphia. I participated in the virtual conference, and one of the sessions I attended was given by Malcolm Reed, who is the Executive Secretary of the Joint Information Systems Committee in the UK. And this is a slide directly from his presentation. Reed says, many effective examples of openness in the scholarly and academic environment, and listed four, open access, open data, open source, and uh, OER, and several others. Another slide in his presentation had several others listed. He said, all of these have been pursued by enthusiasts, either individual enthusiasts or a group of faculty, perhaps in a discipline who've been enthusiastic about one or the others uh, of these things. But institutions as a whole have rarely recognized the value, the strategic value of openness in all of these various forms. Speaking very frankly, librarians were enthusiastic, became very enthusiastic about open access, that particular part of the openness agenda, uh, more than a decade ago. And I'm grateful to say that I feel like librarianship is moving more in this strategic direction of recognizing um, the value of openness in all of its manifestations. I hope that you, you sense that in this presentation. Um, you'll see, I, I'm actually going to go from the bottom. Forces for change in the library arena relative to openness have included the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or SPARC, the Association of College and Research Libraries, which is a division of the American Library Association, and the Association of Research Libraries. SPARC's entire strategic agenda is built around openness, and particularly open access. And both for ACRL and ARL, uh, a key plank of their strategic plans for the next several years is um, centered around the scholarly publishing arena and what we can do to do that. Libraries recognized there are a lot of imbalances in the scholarly publishing arena, and we need to do something to correct those imbalances. Financially, that imbalance um, had its worst um, manifestation in what was called the serials crisis. Uh, largely or hugely increasing prices and profits for commercial publishers, particularly in STEM fields, uh, as opposed to stable at best and shrinking library budgets at worst, which meant that libraries could acquire less and less of the scholarly resources that their faculties and students needed. In the intellectual property rights, signing over all of the rights to the publishers and leaving nothing in the hands of the scholars who are actually doing the research. To the point that, in some cases, they were denied the right to use the materials that they had authored in their own classrooms for their own students. Um, and the quality mechanism spoken of here, at least in the developed world, there hasn't been. I mean, we heard today, uh, India like, would like to open 50,000 universities. There is no such movement in the United States or any other developed country that I'm aware of. So the stable of um, potential peer reviewers, or the, the stable was the wrong word, I was like to say the number of potential peer reviewers for scholarly materials has been relatively stable, while the number of journals and things to be reviewed has been going up. Um, peer review, if you, if you listen to Clifford Lynch and some of the presentations that he's made, peer review is a broken system. Um, we, have, we work with an editor on our campus. It takes four invitations to get a single peer reviewer for every article in the journal um, that he edits. So what are we doing in the Harold Beebe Library where Elizabeth and I work? Um, in the openness arena, we sponsor an open digital, um, an open access digital repository called Scholars Archive. And you see some of the varieties of material we have there. Uh, electronic theses and dissertations, uh, research papers, whether that is um, something that is pre-peer review or post-peer review or final publication um, formatted as it would be for the journal. Um, all of those varieties are there. Poster sessions, uh, presentations made at conferences, 
We have two fairly interesting, we're calling them research collections, uh, images from our, our historical clothing collection. A uh, theater and media arts professor who curates this collection imaged all of those materials, and we're finding good uptake from costume designers, people who are planning uh, productions and, and wanting to know what, what do things look like. We also are in conjunction with the curator of the Stanley L. Welsh Herbarium in our Life Science Museum, they've begun digitizing the plant specimens that they have there. And if we got all of them digitized, we'd have close to half a million images. It's a very large herbarium. We're also using public knowledge projects, open journal system software, uh, in our Scarlet Periodical Center and are currently hosting 12 titles, either produced at BYU or edited by a member of the faculty at BYU. So it doesn't have to be uh, a BYU publication for us to support that open access. We are, have been digitizing for a number of years materials from our special collections, and they are widely, uh, all of them openly available on the web. One of the most interesting things we've done in the last year is begun partnering with the Internet Archive. We have what's called an Internet Archive Scribe Scanner. Actually, we have three of them in the library, and we are digitizing uh, materials from our collection. So far, only those things that are in the public domain, but scanning, as of yesterday, 9,440 complete books and putting them up on archive.org. Not to be confused with the other archive.org, which is the arxiv.org, and that's the, the high energy physics and, and repository for those kinds of materials. I'll turn the time over to Elizabeth now to talk about uh, what's next in her survey. Good morning. So within this framework of multiple repositories for multiple formats, and then we also have quite a, a solid um, commitment of resources. We have full, three full-time employees who work in scholarly communication and then some additional student employees. Within this framework, we thought, we questioned where to make our next improvements. Jeff mentioned that we, well, we adopted Open Journal System, I think it was probably 18 months ago or two years ago now, and that was a significant improvement for our readers in terms of um, in terms of function and then also for our faculty as a great faculty service in terms of the editorial component. And we thought, what's the next big upgrade that we could make um, from the perspective of teaching faculty? How could we focus our efforts that would improve scholarly communication in an open way? And so we opted to ask broadly and we did this through a survey of 2,300 faculty on campus. We, um, we had about 43 questions. We had 510 responses from all colleges across campus. The respondents were pretty much evenly divided between assistant, associate, and full professor, but we had some additional adjunct uh, faculty respond, as well as some um, folks from department and college administration. The topics that we covered in the survey were really publishing support. You can see those there, open access repositories, data management, digital reformatting, and open access journal hosting. I'll focus my comments today on the publishing support open access repositories and open, open access journal hosting. So uh, we began the survey with a series of pretty straightforward questions about publishing. When asked, 60% of respondents said they were aware of open access journals in their field. You can see those numbers there. Roughly half are publishing or interested in publishing in open access journals. About 53% are aware of their rights to their published work. About 46% are aware that some publishers accept alternative publishing agreements, but only 9% have submitted one of these alternative publishing agreements. We received several comments in this in this section with um, oh, and I go back with um, the people expressing concern about open access, outnumbering the positive comments about two to one. But continuing with. Um, Questions about author rights, 67% are interested in learning more about this topic, but only 29% have used our principal campus resource, that's the BYU Copyright and Licensing Office website, to, uh, to learn more. 22% are familiar with Creative Commons licenses, but just over 7% have ever used a Creative Commons license. And we had several comments requesting additional information um, about, about about open access, about Creative Commons licenses, and that's something that we plan to add to our scholarly communication website, sort of in a frequently asked questions section or in a, a myths, kind of dispelling myths section. We also asked about potential content for and features of open access repositories. 
When asked what types of items faculty would like to add in an open repository, um, they said that published articles, conference presentations, they really received the most interest. And then video image collections and unpublished academic work kind of were in that second tier. When asked what features were most important, um, not surprisingly, they said that web visibility was really the was their most important feature that they'd like in an open access repository, with digital preservation coming in second place. Now, um, we, uh, I think in the library, see that um, easy access through a learning management system. At BYU, we have a new system called BYU Learning Suite. That that's something that in the library we, we would see as a priority because it's a place where we can garner content as <coughs> faculty put materials, maybe their own materials or other open materials, um, make that accessible to classes through the learning management system that we could potentially harvest that and put that into our digital repository. We also asked about hosting open access journals. And when it comes to hosting journals online, our faculty are primarily interested in making professional journals available with some support for student publications and department publications. But when it comes to the nuts and bolts of taking a print journal and creating an online instance, there seems to be some reluctance to, to paying for these services. You can see that only 30 people straight up said, yes, I'd be willing to pay for some of, um, some of the services that it would take to create that online instance. And, and for us, it's not the challenge of digitizing. It's the challenge of creating metadata that really makes these materials discoverable. It's easy to make them accessible in an online environment, but how do you make them discoverable? And that's what costs us at least $9 an hour for a student, several students working on that at a time. Um, in terms of future services, when we asked, respondents indicated a preference for a digital preservation repository for online book publishing and are becoming more interested in, in um, print on demand. So you can see there, I've highlighted those three, that the faculty are most interested in make it. But again, from the library perspective, we're also interested in support for assigning persistent digital object identifiers. And this really becomes a dual opportunity for us. One opportunity is in providing that service, and then the second opportunity is in educating faculty about why that service is important, again, in the spirit of making materials not just available online, but discoverable. So um, from this portion, you've seen that some results of the survey, from this portion of the survey, where are our opportunities, our priorities to impact open access? And um, we talk a lot in academic libraries about information literacy. That's one of our goals, to make sure that students know how to find, select, and analyze information. And I think with our faculty, we have the same opportunity to just um, create a a greater literacy about open access and open content. You can see from some of these con comments that people really, um, really don't know about some of these issues, and that is a baseline opportunity for us. Um, and you can see from that third bullet, someone who said, I, I really don't care about my publishing rights. Journals can have them for all I care. We might be able to provide an alternative perspective for this person just to maybe round out, round out an idea of why his rights to his work might be important. And then also in terms of um, open repositories, well, open access um, isn't main. It, well, this you can see this uh, comment here. I'm hurrying to find my notes. We have an opportunity to dispel skepticism about open access by supporting open repositories. Our goal is not to quit paying for journal subscriptions. We had a few comments that were very, very concerned that we were going to cancel all of our subscriptions. Mm -hmm. But um, our goal is to provide as much access as possible to the scholarly and creative output of our faculty. And our goal is to complement traditional publishing. We can also correct the misunderstanding that open access and peer review are mutually exclusive. Uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals lists thousands of journals that require quality control, <coughs> peer review, or editorial control. And now I'm going to turn it back to Jeff. Just following up one thing that she said, um, it is important for faculty to understand that if we don't bring some rationality to the scholarly publishing system, we will end up not being able to pay for subscription journals. We, there simply isn't enough money out there for any library to do that. So we need to, to educate the faculty on that. Oh, whoops, you already advanced to my slide. As you saw on one of Elizabeth's slides, faculty are concerned about 
the visibility of the materials, what they put into our open access digital repository. And we're concerned about it as well. We're using a system that we're not completely happy with, and we are doing what we can to investigate how do we make it more visible. Ultimately, we may end up having to change the platform we're on, um, but if we have those digital object identifiers for these kinds of things, we'll be able to do that, and, and faculty's material will continue to be, um, well, will continue to be at least as visible and hopefully more visible. We're participating right now on um, bullet number two here in an institute sponsored by the Association of Research Libraries and the Digital Library Federation on e-research or e-science about data. Um, open data is one of those things. There's Malcolm Reed in his presentation said if, if people, if researchers don't have to create all of the data, they, they gather some data, but they can marry it with data that's been gathered by others, there's more that can come out of that. Um, too frequently today, data is sitting in an Excel spreadsheet on somebody's external hard drive, on their flash drive, on five and a quarter inch floppies, and it's being lost. We want to, um, and, and libraries have a, a place in this space to help preserve that. You also saw on Elizabeth's slide, they're interested in digital preservation. They don't want to have to care for those things on their drive, but would, would like them not to be lost as well. So we're investigating what role we can play and how the open access repository can bring that about. One of the problems, you already heard it mentioned in the keynote with um, Mr. Shelton, that standards are a very big part here. Um, if we don't have interoperable, interoperability between repositories, we don't have standards for description of these materials, it will be hard to locate materials that might be uh, relevant to your study. And that gets right down into bullet number three, that budgeting for metadata. Right now, as Elizabeth pointed out, that's where our costs come in doing these kinds of things. We don't have good technological tools yet to be able to take large volumes of material and make sense of them and accurately describe them using some standard controlled vocabulary or ontology. It's a pretty much a human endeavor. I think we will get there, but in the meantime, we have to budget in order to describe the materials that we're putting up. I'm happy to say that uh, BYU is rolling out this new learning management system. We've been using a commercial product off the shelf for more than 10 years now, and faculty have said, this isn't working for us. It's not doing the things we need it to do. So our Office of Information Technology has basically worked with the faculty to design and write a system modularized that will do the things that they want it to do. We're building in the next phase, or one of the next two phases, enhancements for the service hosted by the library for audio and video streaming of materials that we already license so they can be used in the LMS. Also, a copyright subsystem is being written into that. So, if faculty want to use material that is in copyright, they can go out and identify and say, no, you don't have any right to put that up, or yes, you can. One of the ways libraries have been helping, and we have been trying very much to educate our faculty, we license millions of dollars of resources in subscription databases. One of the, as, as Jim Shelton said, um, if we just say free and not better, we're not doing what we need to do. But free is still important. Um, a student shouldn't have to pay any extra for something that's already being paid for. Our library licenses 356 databases at the cost of millions of dollars. Most of those materials are in licenses that allow us to, to put links in the learning management system that will direct the student back to those materials. They should not have to be paid for again. We've had faculty who pay the Copyright Clearance Center to put it into a course pack when they don't need to do that. And we're trying to get that education out, say, for that, we're, we're helping financially both the students and the faculty. Um, lowering the costs and paying only once for that kind of academic content. Um, we had a meeting last week with uh, the administration of our College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, and one of the, the associate deans was responding to a question, what's the take-up of e-textbooks? And he said, there really isn't a lot of take-up of e-textbooks in our college. Particularly in our upper division courses, there isn't take-up of textbooks at all. Most of our faculty are tailoring their curriculum. They're, they're going out and getting articles that 
speak specifically to the topics that they want to cover, and that's all they're putting together. Learning management system, our licenses, put that all in the, the hands of the faculty and the students, and they wouldn't have to pay. We think that's a, a great thing to be doing. Um, that concludes our presentation. Elizabeth will come and join me, and we're happy to take your questions. Yes. Hi, um, John Robertson from Just Cedars. Um, you've talked quite a bit about open access and the like, university academic role in um, supporting access to what are effectively research materials. Um, do you have any thoughts about the university's role in supporting educational content, and supporting, particularly supporting academics in managing and sharing their teaching materials? We, when, we, uh, when we speak with faculty across campus, we don't distinguish between what kind of content we would welcome in our, in our open repository, the Scholars Archive. We encourage them to put any kind of content that they'd like to in there, including teaching materials. It could be um, course materials. It's a very lightly curated collection. Um, but we really leave it up to the faculty to, to let us know, to give us the content. So we encourage them to. Um, and, so we don't put any restrictions on that. Um, we, we encourage them to put to their research materials, academic materials, or their teaching materials. And uh, maybe that's something that we could hit a little harder in collaboration with the School of Education. Do you, do you find them putting a lot of teaching materials? That strikes me as odd because institutional repositories are <coughs> synonymous with research and uh, uh, materials, not teaching and learning materials, like the OAI standard, all these things of being about the institutional archiving of research uh, and publications, not teaching and learning materials. So are you actually finding uptake of people putting teaching and learning materials in? I wouldn't say any great uptake, no. Right. <laughs> but we don't we don't prohibit that. I, I would add a little bit to that. From the administrative perspective, I can tell you that some of our librarians are concerned about Elizabeth's um, stance and my stance that it is a likely curated repository. Um, traditionally, libraries have been in the business, or librarians have been in the business, of selecting from content. Not being able to buy everything, but select good content that will support things. And saying, gee, we're not going to have any, any uh, control mechanisms on what can or can't be put in this repository. The administration's view has been faculty aren't going to want to put up things that don't have any value or that they consider to be dumb or they wouldn't want to be seen. And that's where our likely curated, but she's absolutely right that we haven't seen a lot of uptake. There, there is no restriction on them doing, uh, putting in learning objects or any of the kinds of things that you're talking. Yes? Um, my follow-up comment and a slightly related comment. One, one thing I'd say about that approach is you're assuming faculty will come to you and ask them to give you, ask them, ask you to manage their stuff. <coughs> My, my challenge would be, what are you doing to go to faculty and say, here's good practice? Um, and on a unrelated <coughs> note, I did some survey work with this last year, and I've just tweeted a link to a survey that uh, a colleague of mine is currently doing about OER and libraries. So that's on the open ed hashtag. We try to be as active as we can be in reaching out to faculty. We, um, we certainly work with our subject librarians. Our subject librarians are really the ones who have those, the closest liaison relationships with faculty and departments. And we routinely let our subject librarians know about the range of services that we offer. <coughs> we let faculty know that we are very welcome. We, we welcome them to send us our CVs sorry, their CVs, their publication lists, we'll review those publication lists, and perhaps what we could add to that request is, you know, send us your teaching materials. We can make that more overt, a more overt request. So we, I don't think we think of it as a, you know, we've built it and certainly people will come. We recognize that it's our responsibility to go out and let teaching faculty know the services that we have, the repositories that we have, and how they might benefit them. Um, and that's Jeff had mentioned um, in our new learning management system called Learning Suite. We'd love to build more connections from that learning suite into the repository. And so that makes it, um, so faculty just have to go one place. And then by going that one place, we could potentially grab some of that content. So we're aware that, um, that it's our responsibility to, to spread the message. And we try to do that directly through direct content from contact from the scholarly communications employees 
or especially working with subject librarians. And then we also have an advisory group to the library with a representative from each college on campus. And we make sure that they are aware of these resources too. So we hope to catch in multiple trickle-down ways <laughs> that the interest of teaching faculty. We're also speaking to them as we did last week as we met with the administration in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. It is one of those processes of continuous repetition and the, the elevator speeches and those kinds of things. Sir. I, I, I uh, am a teacher at a community college in California. I teach English, but I'm also the accreditation officer for the college. And I find myself spending more time with accreditation than virtually anything else. I was kind of curious to know, uh, particularly with online issues and digital uh, issues as well, what kinds of challenges or problems that you deal with from an accreditation standpoint, uh, meeting accreditation standards in these areas? Or is it from a library perspective? We have not, I've only been in administration for a little less than two years now, so I really haven't dealt with this. We're coming, we're at the beginning stages of our next accreditation process, but I've never been um, informed that there were accreditation problems related to any of these kinds of things that we've been, been speaking about. Uh, any From any other institutions, are you aware of, of issues related to that? I think sometimes from a faculty perspective, um, it's a different mode of communication with students, and there's a concern about equal access from the, to the materials, the quality of the materials presented, those kinds of things, uh, privacy issues, and so on and so forth. So. Haven't had any of okay. that raised. Okay. We're out of time. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>